All right, open up your Bibles, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 is where we are. Kurt did such a great job leading us through the Red Sea parting last week. And today I want to talk about the connection between remembering and trusting. So I want you to think of it this way. Remembering becomes the fuel for trusting what God's going to do next. Remembering what God has already done becomes the fuel for trusting Him for what He's yet to do. And that's what we're going to see here in Exodus 15. There's this movement after the Red Sea parts and the Egyptian army is washed away and the Israelites are alive and they're looking around going, huh, like we're alive. This is amazing. Like this is crazy. And did you see what just happened? And Exodus 15 shows us what they begin to do. Notice if you have an NIV Bible, it says the song of Moses and Miriam. So Miriam is Moses and Aaron's sister. Jump down to verse 19. They write a song and they get together and they sing verse 19 and following. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. So here you see worship rooted in gratitude is a rightful response to Red Sea moments in our lives. So the Red Sea parts and the armies wiped out and the Israelites are alive and they're like, God just moved in a way that they didn't even have a category for. And what do they do? They say, get Miriam, strike up the band, call together the choir, lift up the voices, get the tambourines. It's time to worship the Lord, to remember what he's just done. And this is what's so significant. And as, even as the Stebers were referring to it in their video, you know one of the biggest kind of gaps when it comes to online church alone at home? As helpful as it can be to kind of bridge this time, one of the things that John and Nicole referenced was there's just kind of a, there's a missing element, especially when it comes to corporate worship and singing together, is it not? Even those of you with the fanciest of TVs and sound systems, I know you can turn it way up and I know you can get the walls to shake with the bass and all that, but but what's missing is there's this collective element. What's missing is this Exodus 15 type moment, that there's something that happens when we get together once a week and we strike up the band and we, we turn up the instruments and we unleash the vocals and we have the congregation gather. What are we doing? We're working the muscles of remembering what God has already done. We're singing songs about the seas he's parted about the cross that he's borne on our behalf, about the life that he's laid down, about the grace that he's given, about the love that he's poured out. And I don't know about you, I need at least once a week for that thing to be jolted back into me again because I forget and I drift and my mind wanders and it gets covered up under all kinds of other things. And here the Israelites are just one chapter removed, 14 Red Sea parts, 15, get Miriam, get the tambourines, get the band, get the choir, and it's time to do what? Verse 21, it says, sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. And it doesn't say you have to have a great voice to do that, which I'm super grateful for, because I don't have that. So it doesn't mean you have to be a great singer. Just sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. We'll put the better vocals up here on mic, so it kind of like trumps over yours anyway. So it'll be, it'll be okay. But sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. What happens there? When we sing, when we internalize these lyrics, when we listen to these words, and sometimes you're going through the kind of week maybe that Donovan's had or that Mary's had or that Kay's had. You have these kind of weeks in your life, and you you come in, and you, you can't sing, but you immerse yourself in a community of people who sing on your behalf. You just let their words kind of carry your words, and their response carry your response. And what happens? There's this building. There's this fueling up through this remembering, this Exodus 15 moment. When God answers prayer, when he parts seas, when he comes through, when he moves a mountain, some of you are in the midst of that right now. God's just come through in ways that just holy crazy. You could have never imagined the script that he's writing. When that happens, what do you do? Exodus 15 is the response God's looking for for Exodus 14 moments in our lives. When the Red Sea parts, when the army's wiped away, when you're still alive and you thought you were at the end of it, 
What do you do at that moment? Exodus 15. You lift up your voice. You gather together. You remember with gratitude what God has done. And that's why we're spending this Lenten season working our way through these things. So this is a family-friendly version of our gratitude journal, and I hope these don't for those of you around here, these should, these should look familiar to you. We're taking the 40 days of Lent, and we're just taking time to pause and maybe personally write our own Exodus 15 song in here. This is kind of the adult version here, and this is the kid and family-friendly version here. But for just what we want to do is just work the muscles all through these 40 days as we prepare for Passion Week and for Resurrection Weekend. And we want to look back and remember in big ways and small ways and all the ordinary ways where God has been faithful, where God has come through, where we work this muscle of gratitude and thanksgiving. That's what this is about. That's what God's looking for from His people. That's why all through the Old Testament you see Him saying, hey, we're going to form a feast. Did you notice all through, those of you reading through the Old Testament right now, did you notice a number of times God's calling His people to get feasts and festivals and celebrations? What's that? It's not that he's just wanting to throw a great big party. He is wanting to throw a great big party, but it's a party of remembrance. Like he says, hey, you're going to have a feast of unleavened bread. What's that about? Well, that's, remember, midnight exodus? Remember when Pharaoh loosened his grip on you? Remember when you couldn't let the bread rise? You had to like pick up your stuff and go in the middle of the night? It's the feast of unleavened bread. Throw a party, strike up the band, get everybody together, and then tell the story. Remember, remember when you were in bondage. Remember when God came through. Or the feast of Passover. Remember the blood of the lamb over the door frames. Remember? So picture these. So it's always this, these feasts and these festivals and these celebrations that God is about gathering his people to get together. And he inserts these rhythms in their life to help push back against what we know the tendency, the human condition is. We just forget. Like, that's just not unique to you or to me. That's a human thing. It's a fallen human thing that we just forget Exodus 14. And so if Exodus 15 is his expectation of how his people should respond, like, hey, remember, celebrate, work the muscles with gratitude, write the songs, lift up your voice and sing, get together with God's people, do that. If that's what he's looking for. Exodus 16 shows us like how fickle and fragile our hearts really are. Because stay with me now, only six weeks removed from the Red Sea. We're going to read this. Six weeks. Okay? Here we go. Exodus 16, verse 1. The whole, circle, whole Israelite community. When I read that, I said, seriously, Lord? Like the whole? Like a whole group? Set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole, really whole community, circle what? Grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. You're like, what? There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Are you kidding me? So in your Bibles, I want you to circle the word grumbled, and I want you to write the Hebrew word for it, because it's such a great word. You know what the Hebrew word for grumbled is? It's called loon. Say loon. Loon. Say it louder. Loon. Those of you at home, say loon with your kids. Loon. It's a Hebrew word for grumbled. It means they obstinately complained. That's what the word means. And it's not just a small segment. It says the whole community is getting, are you kidding me? Six weeks removed from the seas parting and the Egyptian army getting washed away and you surviving six weeks and they're going loony. I like that line. Did you like that line? Loony. They're crazy. They're looking back and don't we have a tendency to do this? They're editing their history. Boy, I'm really good at doing this. Anybody else good at this? Where you can just go, you know, God's brought you through something. God's taken you through. He's answered prayer. He's parted seas. He's moved mountains. He's, God's just taken you through some things. And, and then maybe six weeks, maybe six months, maybe, whatever, maybe six days, you're just like, you just kind of edit the history. Of, in this case, Egypt... They begin to reminisce about Egypt. What are they focused on with Egypt? 
the food. I'm like, anything else may be jumping out? You're only remembering the food you ate? How about the brick quotas you had? How about the foreman who whipped your back? How about whacked out Pharaoh who's leading this whole thing? You know that Egyptian army that was coming over the hill at the Red Sea? They weren't coming over to be like Uber Eats and deliver you food. They were coming to wipe you out. Anybody remember that? They just want to remember the, they're editing their history. That's what we have. That's not just an Israelite thing. That's not an Old Testament thing. That's a human thing. God pulls us out of something. He extracts us from our own personal Egypts, whatever those are. Think of it this way. Many of you, God pulls out of a toxic relationship. You were in a relationship. You were crying out to God for breakthroughs. He heard your cries. He parted the seas. He moved mountains. He broke you out of that relationship. He gave you fresh perspective. Just a few days, you're just like, man, I had no idea how messed up that whole situation was until I was removed from it. And you're detoxing from that relationship. And maybe six weeks goes by, maybe a couple months goes by, and you get that text message from him or her. And that text message just brings up all the history. It has all the pictures. And you start scrolling. And then your mind starts going. And you're like, oh, I kind of miss. And then you think about sending the text. And then, because in your head you go, you just edit out all the toxic parts. And you just kind of focus in on if there were any strands of goodness. You're just like, just the meat in Egypt. Forget the brick quotas. Forget the fact we were oppressed and enslaved. Forget Pharaoh. I'm just going to focus on the meat, and then I want to go back. That's called going loony. The Bible word for that in in Proverbs is foolishness. That we would forget, that we would edit out what God has extracted us from, that we'd have such short-term memory that we want to go back. Man, this is a human thing. This is something we ought to work through. This is where we need God's help. I mean, God just literally 400 years of enslavement, he just brought him out of. Pretty big deal when he parted the Red Sea as Kurt was Like, that was a big moment. Pillar of fire going behind him, Egyptian army. I mean, that was holy, crazy moment. Six weeks ago, he just did that. And you want to go, what? There's not like, you want to go back on that path? We added our history. And I want you to see the connection is, do you see like when we lose the rhythm of Exodus 15, remembering and worshiping with gratitude, do you see what it opens the door to? It opens the door to obstinately complaining about what God has just freed us from. We kind of edit our history. We open up the door to selective memory. We forget even more easily, which is why we've got to work these muscles. When the remembering and gratitude muscles atrophy, it opens the window to loonness response. You get entrenched and you lose sight of what God has already done. We forget the ways He's already come through, and we're susceptible to edit history and to go back to the very place He's freed us from. And generally speaking, like the reputation of Jesus' church in the world today, especially in North America, like we've got a really good reputation for obstinately complaining. Like we've got a PhD in loonness. Like if you just ask the general person who's a long ways away from Jesus' church, like what their view of Jesus' church and Jesus' people, like one of the top of the stack feedbacks will be, man, we're really good at getting together and complaining and drawing attention to what we don't like. Like we're really, really good at it. Now, not us, but let's just imagine like, you know, not our group. I'm just saying like Jesus' people in general really are well known for this. So I like what Mark Batterson wrote, I put this quote in your notes, too often the church complains against the culture instead of creating it. The energy being spent on criticism is being stolen from creativity. It's sideways energy. Hear this. I try to live by Michelangelo's maxim, criticized by creating. Quit complaining about what's wrong and do something that makes a difference. Write a better book, start a better business, create a better product, run a better campaign, draft a better bill, produce a better movie. Does that sound like a pastor who's pastoring in the heart of Washington, D.C.? That's where Batterson's pastoring. 
You think he's got like some experience in the throes of that? <laughs> and do you notice in Exodus 16, like, who bore the brunt of the people's obstinate complaining? What did verse 2 say? Who were they complaining to? Moses and Aaron. So the spiritual leaders, they tend to bear the brunt of the lunous response of the people, which we've seen this before, like the tendency in the human, again, this isn't just an Israeli thing, this isn't just an Old Testament thing, I think this is a human thing. Like there's something in the human condition where we want to turn immediately horizontal, we want to take all of our issues horizontal when God is always trying to get us to start vertical. Get your heart sorted out vertically with God first, and then move to make things right horizontally. And what do we do as humans? We immediately jump to, it's always a people-to-people issue. Like the people are bringing all their, it's a Moses and Aaron issue. The reason the spiritual leaders are always, they're like, it's kind of like, you know, thrust the spear in the heart of the messenger. It's like, this is 80 and 83-year-old. These guys didn't want the job in the first place. And here you are just throwing your spears and darts at them. Because they're delivering God's message. And here you're going to get a good window into good spiritual leadership in a minute. Watch how they handle it. But I want you to see like the tendency is we go horizontal. We make it people-to-people issues. We do this in marriage. We do this in work settings. We do this in sports and arts and team environments. We make it a people-to-people issue when first God's like, hey, get your heart vertical. Get set vertically first and then move out to work through things horizontally, and that's what's going on here in Exodus 16. They're grumbling against Moses. They're grumbling against Aaron. R.T. Kendall put it this way, sometimes the greatest opposition to what God wants to do next comes from those who are on the cutting edge of what God did last. Think about that one. The people who are on the cutting edge of the Red Sea moment now are the ones that are lobbying and trying to rally the troops to go back. And Moses and Aaron are bearing the brunt of that kind of resistance, that grumbling, that murmuring, that obstinate complaining. So watch what happens, verse 4. Then the Lord says to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, underline this, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other day days. So notice the people complain and make it a Moses and Aaron issue, and God steps in and turns it, hey, no, this is actually a me and them issue. God says, don't worry, Moses and Aaron, I got this. I'm going to provide for them. So he immediately shifts it back again, takes it away from Moses and Aaron, says, I'm going to provide. I'm going to provide bread in the morning and meat in the evening. This is how he's going to work the equation. And notice he's going to do it in such a way to test them. Do you see this is the larger story? We've got to keep this in mind. Like, what's God doing in this part of the story we're in Exodus? He's moving his people. He's creating a nation. He's bringing them out from 400 years of enslavement in Egypt, and he's bringing them up to the promised land. What's their role? What's their purpose? Genesis 12, Abrahamic covenant. He created a nation called Israel. He's blessing them. He's protecting them. He's providing for them because eventually they're going to be his people who display God's character, his greatness, his glory, his goodness to all the other nations. So God's got a lot of eggs in this basket. He's got a lot of eggs in this Israelite basket. He's like, he's not just going to get them to the promised land. He's concerned about who they'll be when they get there. And so whatever he's doing to move them out of Egypt and move them across the Red Sea and now through this desert wandering, he's going to do it in such a way to build their hearts, to deepen their faith, to develop their character so when they get to the promised land, there's a better shot they're going to represent what he wants represented there. So right now he's like, hey, I'm going to test them in this. I want to see how their, let's see how their trust factor is, even though the first part of the chapter should tell you, it's not, you're skating on thin ice here, Lord, with this, because they're already wanting to go back. He said, well, I'm going to provide but I'm going to do it in such a way to kind of test them. I'm going to build some daily trust in them. Verse 8, let's see what happens. Moses said, you will know that it's the Lord when he gives you meat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning. So it's a nice balanced diet. You see that the Lord giving you some carbs, giving you some protein, see the good rhythm there. And because he has heard your grumbling, underline this in your Bibles, you're grumbling against who? Against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us but against the Lord. Wow. That's sobering, is it not? That should give us some sobering. Like, right, God views, like, 
the way they were handling their obstinate complaining, he viewed it ultimately as grumbling that Moses and Aaron were just kind of the outlet, but ultimately it was against the Lord. And I know for me, sometimes as a pastor, I, I try to as lovingly as possible say, when some people are, are coming at me with all kinds of issues, I, when, I, when the kind of temperature of the conversation can slow down a little bit, I say, you know what? I wonder, I wonder if at the core of this is it's maybe a you and the Lord issue. I want to help you through that. I know that it seems like the outlet might be towards me or to some other spiritual leader, but I wonder if God's trying to get at something with you and him. And that's what I think got Moses is used like, hey, you guys are all coming at us, but notice the Lord wants you to, it's really a you and him issue. And we've all got a, a role and a place in that. And I think that's the kind of spiritual leadership, by the way, that you want to follow. You want a good window? Here's a good window in the spiritual leadership you want to follow. The person or persons who keep redirecting your heart to get right with the Lord, to keep redirecting you back, who turn it from people to people to at least start with vertical before we go horizontal. Those are the kind of spiritual leaders I want to follow, the spiritual leaders I want to be around, who keeps directing my heart back to the Lord, get it centered back with God. That's what Moses is doing here. It would have been easy for him to just power up and defensive. I mean, it would have been easy for him to do that, but he just, hey, this is a really you and the Lord issue, and I want to help you with that. That's good spiritual leadership. And so the bread comes down in the morning and the meat comes in the evening and you'd think, man, they just got to be like so happy and you'd think it would just be like such a great moment. And then verse 17, the Israelites did as they were told. Wow, that's like a good line. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, that's nine cups, he who gathered much did not have too much and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. You're like, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. Keep going. Verse 19, then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. All right, here we go. 20, however, uh uh-oh, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. So here was the trust test. Do you see it? God was providing for them in such a way that it'd be like, What's verse 19 say? God's expectation is you just gather enough for that day and just nine cups will handle you for the day and then you trust that I'll provide tomorrow. And some did that and they were like, and then verse 20 says others did not so much. They were like, hey, nine cups is good for today. I may get 18 cups to cover today and tomorrow or 27 cups to cover the next, you know, kind of early picture of hoarding. So hoarding isn't like a 21st century phenomena here. Like this is human condition issue right here where it's like, okay, so God's looking for what from his people? He says, I'm going to do this in a way that you trust me. Trust what? Trust that I will give you each day what you will need for that day. Does that sound strikingly familiar to something Jesus prayed? Matthew chapter 6, when he was forming the Lord's Prayer. Do you think Jesus might have had this in mind? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our what? Daily bread. Oh, I think he had Exodus 16 in mind. Translated for us today. But we trust God for today. We trust He'll provide. He'll come through with what's needed today. Or are we going to be like, well, I do trust you, Lord, but I'm going to stockpile a little too. I'm going to stockpile for tomorrow versus trust you for today. Even though He gave real clear instructions, hey, don't stockpile this, and it filled up with maggots, lest they needed more of an illustration. Can you picture the crew going to Moses and Aaron going, hey, what's up with this? My bread and meat are all covered with maggots. Can you picture that conversation? Oh my gosh, that had to be like, what are you talking about? Loony? So what are you doing? Why is it filled with maggots? Well, you know, we took like 18 or 27 cups because we thought, you know, we didn't know if tomorrow was going to be okay. It's like, The Lord's expectations were clear, and the people's response is a mixed bag. That's kind of us, is it not? It's a picture of like, why is it so hard for us to trust Him for our daily bread? Why is it so hard for me to do that? I know sometimes, I know sometimes in my own life, it's it's hard for me to trust Him for the current if I'm kind of disappointed with what's most recently happened. So for some of you, you're carrying some kind of 
weights of disappointment. Maybe the Red Sea hasn't parted. Uh, maybe you're standing there and you're just waiting. You're, you're like where Kurt said, you're stand still and see the deliverance and you're standing still and you're trusting, but for whatever reason, the east wind hasn't started to blow and the ground hasn't started to dry up and it feels like the army's getting closer and, you know, it just hasn't unfolded like you wanted. The mountain hasn't moved. The circumstances haven't just, it's just nothing like you envision. And so you're carrying these strands of disappointment. How about you? When I go through those stretches, it's hard for me to live in the daily bread rhythm. Or maybe another stretch is, it might be hard for you to trust Him to provide today because in your heart of hearts, you, you might be convinced you know a little bit better than He. Like you're like, you know what, Lord? I hear your plan, like the Israelites here. I hear your plan, just keep enough. And by the way, He had him like establish the Sabbath here. So on the sixth day, He told him, gather double for the sixth. So then you rest on the seventh. And the people got to the sixth, they gathered double, and then they went out looking for more on the seventh. What's that? Because God's trying to build, he's trying to build some things in him. And Moses comes like, what are you guys doing? Like, there's, no, there's nothing on the seventh. Sabbath, it's rest. That's why you have twice as much on the sixth. And so maybe it's this camp of, when we think we know better than God, here's the camp we land in, self-reliance. We'll just kind of set up our tent in the camp of self-reliance. We know better than God. We've got this. We think we're smarter, stronger, wiser, whatever. God, we know your plans. We look at your ways. We hear what you're saying, but we think we've got this. Or perhaps an, another layer of why it's hard to trust in this daily bread rhythm is it's hard to trust someone who you have a distant relationship with. And if you're in that space this morning, and, and maybe it's that, you know, you're coming back to church, you're coming back to faith, you're coming back to Jesus, and if you're honest, it's just been a little too distant for a little too long, so it's really hard to trust someone you don't know well. So I want to encourage you to come back and get to know this God, get to know Jesus, get to know the, the character, get to know His love, get to know His grace, get to know His faithfulness, and the more you get to know Him that strengthens this work of trusting Him for the daily bread. So you see this whole connection from Exodus 14, 15, and 16. Do you see the rhythm here? So God parts the seas, He moves the mountains, He dries up the waters, He wipes out the Egyptians, He preserves the Israelites' life. Like He comes through in holy, crazy ways, and then He strikes up the band, get Exodus 15, get Miriam, get the tambourines, get the worship team, and sing to the Lord, for He's highly exalted. That's the remembering part. We work these muscles and here's what we do. We remember. Here's the, here's the muscle. We remember if he did that, it becomes the fuel to trust him that he can handle this. If he did that, church, what's your that? Your most recent. What's your that? Your personal Egypt, your Red Sea. What is he bringing through? What has he brought you through? Remember what he's already done. Your that. And then let that fuel the trust for the daily bread in the this. Or the alternative is we go loony on the story. We just start obstinately complaining. We start whining. We start wanting to go back. We start acting what the Bible calls foolishness. We'll return to our bondage and oppression that God freed us from. We'll start turning horizontal and taking the issues out on everyone else when really in the heart of hearts it's a you and the Lord journey. That God say, I want you to trust me. Do you trust I'm a God of my word? Do you trust that I have your best in mind? Do you trust that I'm faithful? Do you trust that I hear your cries? I see your circumstances. I know your situation, and I'm going to come through for you. Do you trust that God will do that? It may need to be kind of working through the disappointment stuff. It may be working through the unmet expectation stuff. It, it may be working through the distant relationship piece, but to get to the place where the remembering forms the fuel, the foundation for the trusting, remembering that, to trust Him for this. Worship team, why don't you come on up? We're going to draw this to a close by doing what Exodus 15 said. We've got a couple of other songs to sing together today. And, you know, this all came kind of to a head for me on, on Friday night. We had gone through, like many of you, when you've 
had family memorial services, you know, you head back to the funeral home at the end of the full day and after the, the meal with the family and everything. We go back to the funeral home and what do you do? You, you work through all the plants and the flowers and all the wonderful notes and cards everyone sent in. And, it's, it, and so you're kind of working through with all that and you're loading up the cars and you're getting everything kind of dropped off, especially to Kay's apartment. And um, it was about 9.30 or so Friday night. Kendra and I and Lily and Kaylin, we had Kay in the car and we pulled up to her apartment. And we walked into the little lobby area. Yeah. Put our arms around each other. And we prayed. Prayed for Grandma Kay as she was gonna, you know, go up to her apartment alone for the first time in 11 plus years. As I finished praying, guess who started praying? Grandma Kay. And her prayer was such a window into this. She remembered 80 plus years of her life how many Red Seas do you think she's got to see? A woman of great faith, great prayer. Her life's been hard. But in her prayer, she remembered who God is and his promises. She remembered how he carried, him, carried her along. She remembered how he had inserted Russ into her life at just the right time. She remembered all of that. So at the end of her prayer, she could dig into her purse and get out her key and walk through the door to trust him for this. I know for Kendra, it was probably one of the hardest images of the week. The weekend for her was we walked back to the van to watch her mom walk through that doorway. Because the way that, you know, long-term care facilities and COVID restrictions, we couldn't all just, you know, go up. We had to say our goodbyes there. But I don't know what your this is this morning. But the Lord wants to remind you about that. Everybody has a that. And we're coming up this uh, Passion Week's coming real quick. That's big capital that. to remember what he's already done, to let that fuel the trust for your this, what he is yet to do. Let's pray. God, thank you for all the ways you're faithful. When a story like this reminds us how quickly we become faithless, how quickly we forget. Thank you for your grace that doesn't give up on us. Uh, thank you for moments like this when we get together and for bands like this and worship teams and everyone who puts together songs and it reminds we just work these muscles now. We're going to remember. We're going to sing to the Lord for your highly exalted. We're going to remember all the ways that you've come through. And in that, would you just breathe by the power of the Spirit? Just fill up our trust tank right now to trust you for what's ahead.